The legislative fight over a proposed Georgia religious freedom bill has gone national. Does the bill guarantee the right to practice your faith, or is it a license to discriminate? Plus, a conversation with DeKalb County State Representative Mike Jacobs. He joins us in the studio tonight. And we'll have a report from our Capitol team as we head to the final days of the legislative session. Lawmaker starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. We're at day 32 of this year's legislative session, just eight days to go. Tonight, communities in the north central part of DeKalb want city status. Is that a good or a bad deal for the rest of the county? And the debate over the Religious Freedom Bill gets even thornier. But first, with time running out on this year's session, Pat St. Clair is tracking a lot of action at the Gold Dome. Pat? Thank you, Bill, and good evening. There was an overflow crowd today at the Senate committee hearing into medical marijuana. Chairman Renee Unterman, who in effect killed the medical marijuana bill last year, had promised that she would help write a compromise between the Senate bill approved last week on medical marijuana and the House bill that was already approved. The Senate version of the bill took a much more cautious approach, calling for expansion of a medical marijuana study already underway and supervised by the FDA. House Bill 1, on the other hand, gives parents of children with seizure disorders and people with eight other conditions immunity from prosecution for using cannabis oil brought to Georgia from other states. Senator Unterman says she did her best to strike a compromise. You know, we have successfully accomplished what we wanted to do in... Um Putting these two pieces together, is it exactly what anybody on that survey wanted? No, it's not. <laughs> I can tell you that. But that's the part of trying to get a bill. And, uh, you know, I don't know if this is going to go to a conference committee or not, but that's part of the committee's process. I wanted to leave it open to you. Valerie Weaver's seven-year-old son, Preston, suffers from seizure disorder. He is currently in the clinical trial that the Senate bill would have expanded. At a news conference earlier in the day, she said it's helping, but not enough. Although we are seeing great results so far, if we do not gain full seizure control by the end of this trial, we would like the option to try a different product, such as cannabis oil that contains a small amount of THC much like what is, what is proposed in House Bill 1, to see if the combination of the cannabinoids, also known as the entourage effect, could possibly give us the control that we so desperately yearn for. Georgians need the option of this medicine. That's what we're talking about here today, medicine. HB1 sponsor Alan Peake thanked Chairman Unterman for her hard work and said he was encouraged. I am incredibly grateful for what you presented here. This is very, very close, and, and, I'm, and, I, and I know you, you've listened to a lot of people over the last couple of weeks, and so uh, I am, on behalf of a lot of families and citizens, thank you for, for what you've put together. I think we're, we're going to get a deal done here, which is very good news. The amended medical marijuana bill was approved by the committee and will now go to the Rules Committee for further consideration. A coalition of groups representing minority businesses gathered at the Capitol today. They're calling on lawmakers to include minority and women-owned firms in the billion-dollar transportation bill. Currently, 96 percent of the firms that contract with the state of Georgia to fix bridges and roadways are white-owned. Minority contractors say whether the projects are state-funded or federal Federally funded, they are left out in the cold. With the federal program is 2.5 percent, and without the federal program is 1.1 percent in a state that's 30 percent African American. Now, you do the math. The one thing that is the most egregious impediment is the failure of the state to set a goal, and the way we know that is the goals are set for the federally funded programs. And the performance is better. The representation is double what it is in the state funded. The transportation bill has already passed out of committee and been sent on to the full Senate for consideration. It is one of the major pieces of legislation that we are keeping a watch on, so we will keep you updated on what happens. Well, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush stopped by the Capitol today as he continues to prepare for a likely presidential bid. He spoke briefly in both chambers about the importance of pushing for broad education reforms. 
If we stand pat with what we have, here's the deal. A child that's going to be born in your public hospital, Grady Hospital here in Atlanta, may never get a job. Or, or if you have the courage to continue down the path of reform, we'll have, and every state does this, we'll have everybody born in this country will have a chance to achieve earned success. Wush is in town for fundraisers, but he also joked that he really came to town to meet Ludacris. The Atlanta-based entertainer was honored by lawmakers today for the work of his charitable foundation. Our communities, they definitely need fixing. Some of our systems are badly broken, and we can't wait on government institutions, social programs, and policies alone to fix our communities. We have to look inward, and that's what I mean when I say leading by example. And that's the type of leadership that I continue to do and what I've been doing for over a decade now with the Ludacris Foundation. The Ludacris Foundation has been helping children across the country since 2001. That is it for us from here, Bill. Back to you in the studio. Tonight, Republican State Representative Mike Jacobs, he's in his 10th year of serving the citizens of Brookhaven, and our frequent guest, Greg Bluestein, political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Welcome to both of you. It's nice to have you here. It's Representative here, Jacobs, um, we're winding down. Only, uh, only seven, eight more days to go in this session. Are, is it, are we at that time when we really have to be careful about all the really crazy things that can happen down there? Well, <laughs> we're certainly at the time where we need to be keeping an eye on everything because you never know what might pop up. All right. Let's start. Uh, because you're uh, a representative in DeKalb County, let, let's talk about the city bills that have been out there. Um, uh, uh, there's uh, been a, an, an effort that's gone on for a couple of years now to carve out cities in Tucker. Uh, create a city of Tucker and of La Vista Hills in that north central part of DeKalb County. Um, is this finally the year when you imagine that this goes forward and it happens? And is that a good thing? Well, I think we're likely to see La Vista Hills and Tucker this year. Uh, I, if, you, if you had asked me a week ago or maybe two weeks ago uh, when uh, the La Vista Hills proposal in particular lacked a bill sponsor, mm -hmm. um, I, I, would not have, I wouldn't have been sure whether or not those two proposals were going to pass. But uh, now that uh, both of them have passed the House prior to crossover day, uh, they obviously have a receptive senator, uh, a receptive uh, sponsor in Senator Fran Miller over mm -hmm. in the Senate. Um, I, I think that it is uh, quite likely that we'll see the two proposals pass. Um, to be sure, uh, we also need to work on the impact on DeKalb County that new cities, uh, the possible formation of new cities might have. Um, and we do have some legislation pending this session um, to address uh, various uh, concerns with regard to DeKalb County itself, uh, whether that be uh, strength, strengthening the eth ethics board or requiring an internal auditor, um, or the host proposal, which I'm carrying, House Bill 215, which will deal with the way that the homestead option sales tax is divvied up between the county and the municipalities. So you kind of really addressed two issues in talking about ways in which you're trying to make uh, DeKalb County uh, r remain whole in all of this. Part of it is you talk about about uh, strengthening the ethics and, 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 and that sort of thing. So that goes to the whole question of whether or not the uh, residents of those communities want to be free of DeKalb County because of their concerns about the way government has been run in the county at least well, recently, yes? Well, ultimately, I mean, we have to recognize that whether or not citizens decide to incorporate, whether they, the General Assembly gives them that opportunity to vote in a referendum, and then whether or not they vote yes in the referendum, we are all still citizens of DeKalb County. Mm -hmm. And uh, the headlines of uh, recent times uh, have not been good. Uh, frankly, I, I love the county I live in. I want to see the county strengthened. Um, and ultimately, Ultimately, I think it is our responsibility as legislators to make sure that we are addressing head on the issues that face DeKalb County. And that's what the ethics proposal and the auditing proposal and fixing the homestead option sales tax, what those are all aimed at. Greg? Yeah, you're also sponsoring legislation that would end a, that would lift a spending restriction on MARTA. This has been going on for years. What's different about this year? Why do you think it could actually pass this year? Do me a favor. Before we move on to sure. MARTA, let's ask one a couple, let's make sure we understand one aspect 
aspect of the DeKalb County's um, uh, matter. Um, Greg, there are people who worry, and, and, and Representative uh, uh, is, he, he's basically trying to deal with it, Representative Jacobs, by talking about homestead exemption. But there's this concern about draining tax revenues from the county as you start incorporating cities, right? And what's left of the unincorporated county. Already you're seeing in the Dunwoody area, the, the, the police stations are moving elsewhere because they have so little territory to patrol. Well, and that's what the home, that's what the proposal that deals with the homestead option sales tax is, is aimed at. I mean, right now we have a, a sales tax that, uh, that you know, is DeKalb's last penny, the seventh penny, um, that is 80% for property tax relief and 20% for infrastructure. And that 20% uh, is divvied up between the existing cities and the counties, such that the county receives very little of it. Um, the proposal that we have on the table now uh, it enables an additional penny splash in DeKalb County, takes the homestead uh, property tax relief to 100% of that host penny. So that all goes back to the taxpayers. And then we're going to look to an eighth penny penny sploss that DeKalb County would share in uh, to a significant degree and certainly do much better than they're doing now under the existing host right. scheme. So I want to get to Marta, but I do want to ask yeah. one more city question. And, and, and I know this isn't your territory uh, specifically, but of course we're all watching as, uh, as Mayor Kasim Reed uh, says he's all for annexing uh, North Druid Hills, parts of North Druid Hills. Do you have a do you have a dog in that hunt, or you? How do you feel about that? I I, I don't have a dog in that hunt um, uh, because I don't represent the area. Um, but I, I well I'm I'm about to now reverse exactly what I just That's told fine. you. Right? No. Um, the the the. The city of Atlanta annexation proposal, to my mind, requires the uh, the uh, assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, <laughs> of the uh, city of Atlanta delegation and the DeKalb delegation. I don't see a planet on which a majority of the DeKalb delegation exists yeah. to pass um, that annexation by the city of Atlanta. My concern over it is that it, it includes not just uh, what what the the local government is in that area, but it also takes some of the schools with it. Um, and uh, that is ultimately p potentially going to lead to a need to redistrict schools all across the county, yeah. whether you're in Dunwoody or Lithonia, your kids and where they go to school could be affected. And right. I don't think there are any, there. I don't think any DeKalb legislator wants to deal with that. I certainly don't. All right. It, it, Greg, I do think you were about to ask about uh, Marta and of course, uh, uh, Representative Jacobs is the chair of the MARTA Oversight Committee. So, uh, sorry I interrupted no, you. No, don't worry. Ago. No, th it's been a perennial, perennial issue. It seems like it comes up every year that, that MARTA wants the spending restriction lifted in order for it to make more capital investments. Explain what the re spending restriction is. Well, I think Representative Jacobs can explain it a little better than me, but... Well, it, it's the it's the requirement that uh, of every of every dollar of sales tax revenue from the MARTA sales tax that comes into MARTA, 50% is used for operating expenses. No more than 50% can be used for capital. Um, and uh, obviously, it's been on the uh, it's been a part of the MARTA Act, the the governing law for MARTA for a long time. We have from time to time suspended it for periods of time, um, and right now we're in the middle of a three. -year suspension that was uh, was just put in place last year I believe um, but uh, with uh, all of the machinations around the um, around the uh, transportation bill and and all of the moving parts affecting transportation this session that uh, a permanent repeal of the 50 50 split has found its way into the mix um, and I I would give it better than even odds of passing it. why is that important well, I, 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 I think the 50-50 the split itself is important as a way to hold MARTA accountable at the end of the day. Um, you know, we have been through some bad times at MARTA, but these days with Keith Parker at the helm, I, I think it's safe to say that um, uh, MARTA is finding ways to, uh, uh, to become a leaner, more efficient operation, um, to uh, supplement its revenues with things like concessions and transit-oriented development projects um, that ultimately have MARTA's uh, uh, budget from a cash-in, cash-out standpoint um, in the black again. And, uh, and all of this is owing to the leadership of Keith 
Keith Parker. There's a lot, there is a high degree of, uh, of uh, confidence in Keith Parker's leadership at MARTA. And so I think the General Assembly is willing to consider at this point a permanent repeal of the 50-50 split. We are still going to require that MARTA perform a management audit every four years so that we have a, um, and that's a condition for keeping the 50-50 split lifted. Um, and that's a tool for uh, benchmarking MARTA's progress and making sure that they are uh, continuing to achieve efficiencies. Would this pave the way for a MARTA expansion up 400 or down I-20? Well, I think it, we have to be realistic in saying that some infusion of um, additional capital dollars is going to be needed in order to make large scale uh, new transit projects happen. Um, but, uh, but, but, but to be sure, this session with a possible repeal of the 50-50 split on the table um, and uh, some bond money that is uh, slated to be included in the state budget, um, you know, you, you hear a lot uh, from, uh, from uh, proponents uh, of, uh, of transit mm -hmm. that uh, the 50-50 split should be repealed and the state should invest in MARTA. And we're looking at doing exactly those two things this session. So we're going to move on, but Greg, you've been covering the Capitol for a long time. Uh, Representative Jacobs has been very tough on MARTA at various times during his career. It's interesting to hear his changing uh, uh, attitude, especially around the uh, MARTA CEO, who has brought things into balance. Keith Parker has a lot of fans at the Capitol. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of folks who, uh, who, who speak very highly of him. Um, and, and on that front, count me in. Okay, good. Let, let's move on. Um, you know, the transportation bill, uh, Greg, as you know, uh, uh, Tommy Williams was on our show last night. He talks about a new funding formula, some, somewhat different funding formula than the, than the House uh, passed, which would uh, change the amount of the excise tax uh, and uh, add some additional fees of various kinds. Uh, Representative Jacobs, do you think that in the long run this bill is destined for success, even though there are, when they go to conference committee there are going to be some competing ideas for how to raise the money? I think we will pass a transportation bill this session. Uh, so in that regard, yes, I believe it's destined for success. And will it come up? Will it come up to the one billion dollars plus that that um, uh, the governor and others leaders have said they need? Well, I mean that that's all a function of how, what <coughs> it gets what ends up getting worked out in a conference committee. I, I had said all along. Uh, to my colleagues that uh, I've never seen a transportation bill uh, come out, leave the House and then come back from the Senate to the House in exactly the same form we last <laughs> saw it. Um, that obviously is going to occur in this case as well and, and that's uh, consistent with the history of transportation bills in the General Assembly. Um, uh, from the House side, certainly, uh, the reason we looked at the excise tax is that it's it's constitutionally uh, dedicated for transportation purposes, whereas if you're looking at fees in general, uh, those are obviously subject to appropriation by the General Assembly, and, uh, and so that depends on what uh, the General Assembly is willing to do in the state budget in any given year. Okay, Let, let's move on, if you don't mind. We're, we're running out of time for Representative Jacobs. Uh, uh, Greg, there, the uh, governor uh, education bill for the first time uh, this week has drawn a, a an outspoken voice uh, in the Republican caucus in the House saying don't like this bill at all. Is this the first sign of a uh, some revolt among Republicans? And it was not Mike Jacobs. It wasn't Mike Jacobs. <laughs> Certainly State, not. State Rep. Uh, Tommy Benton raised some big concerns about the bill today, saying it basically provides another layer of bureaucracy over state government, state schools. Question whether or not uh, lawmakers who oppose federal intrusion should also oppose state intrusion. He said there's there's other Republicans who feel the way he does, but he's just the first. Well, and that's what I wanted to ask. What are you hearing in your caucus over there? And you're getting the bill from the Senate. Should we expect there are going to be a number of Republicans who are going to uh, oppose the governor on this? I, I don't know. I mean, I, and of course, I, I don't serve on the House Transportation Committee, so I... Education. I, I, I'm sorry. That's Excuse all right. Me, the House, That's all right. I, I do serve on the House Transportation <laughs> Committee. So, 
So I, I don't serve on the House Education Committee, and so I, I, I haven't been privy to the, the debate that has been occurring within that committee. Um, but, I mean, I think we have to be mindful of the fact that it is a constitutional amendment, so it requires 120 votes in the House. Um, there, uh, you know, you, 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 you can't get there just with the Republican. Are you supportive? I, I do fully support the proposal. All right. Representative Mike Jacobs, um, thank you so much for coming in. We'll uh, be interested in watching you as the rest of the session progresses. And uh, we appreciate getting a chance to see you on Lawmakers tonight. I'm, thank I'm you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thank Good. you. Still ahead on Lawmakers tonight, the rhetoric ramps up on both sides of the debate over RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. We'll take a look at that issue. It's an issue that promises to become more divisive in the days ahead. news wasn't just a commodity, but a commitment. The fiscal cliff is a fiscal suicide. Why shouldn't we explore every side of the story? The Syrian army had pulled back. Where can you turn for news you can trust? How do we make sense of something like this? On PBS, we believe journalism should never stop asking questions. Give to your PBS station and support independent journalism. We answer to no one but you. This is 88.5 FM, Atlanta's new source for your news and information. Good morning. Let's start the conversation. What's on your mind, Atlanta? We want to hear from you. The news and information you've been looking for is here on 88.5. From Peachtree City to Piedmont Park, from Norcross to Decatur, GPB Atlanta is the source for stories from your community. All news, all information, all day. There are great music festivals in the world, but there are very few that bring these kind of musicians all together under the same roof. The Savannah Music Festival celebrates its return for a 26th season in 2015. A world-class celebration of musical arts spanning March 19th through April 4th. Renowned artists in jazz, classical, Americana, and world music make this Georgia's largest musical arts event. Get tickets now at savannahmusicfestival.org. Georgia's Department of Public Safety was created on this date, March 19, 1937. Governor E.D. Rivers signed the act into law. It created the Bureau of Investigation, known today as the GBI and the State Patrol. Welcome back to Lawmakers. Greg Lustein of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution is still with me here tonight. By the way, he is a contributor to the uh, political blog, AJC Political Insider, uh, which is a daily must-read for people interested in politics. So let's talk, Greg, about the Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act. It's Senate Bill 129, sponsored by Senator Josh McCoon. The disagreements over what it means seem to be getting more and more uh, pronounced. On Monday, a large group of uh, people turned out at the Capitol to protest the bill, which they see as a license to discriminate against the LGBT community. Meanwhile, Atlanta Talk radio host and national political figure Eric Erickson, who also edits the website redstate.com, is stirring the pot on the other side of the issue. He says Governor Deal and other leaders aren't doing enough to get the bill passed. Uh, the Daily Show, John Stewart, uh, took a poke at this bill uh, the, the other day. Elton John Elton came out with an John. editorial in opposition to it. Yeah, and we got we got a tell us about the robocalls that are out there. And now there's going to be robocalls uh, hitting lawmakers and residents alike, trying to galvanize support for this for this legislation because it seems like it needs it. House Speaker David Ralston, who we'll hear later, is 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 wary of bringing it to the floor. And so it, it will take that to reach it to the next level. It's already passed the Senate, but it needs a House vote to get, get to the next level. Well, you know what? You mentioned uh, the Speaker, and uh, um, I did a long interview with uh, Speaker Ralston last week on key issues, and, and one of them was uh, the RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Let's uh, listen uh, to what he had to say. If a constitutional guarantee is not sufficient, then what is this bill, this statute, going to do that our Constitution doesn't do. So, Greg, what's going on here? <laughs> a a, a, a uh, poker game is going on here. Now, the day of the transportation vote last week, 
you saw House Speaker Ralston and Sam Teasley, who is the House's sponsor of this legislation, in a very heated conversation. Now, Sam Teasley and a lot of his allies voted against the transportation bill, which is probably the Speaker's number one priority of the session. Uh, so there's, there's, there's talk that these two could be combined, these two could be linked. At the same time, you've got Governor Deal, who said he's, he's open to signing the legislation if it reaches his desk. So there could be a very complicated poker game. This could be a, a chip to get some of the religious liberty, you know, some of the so, sort of the right-leaning caucus to vote on other bills that are important to either the speaker or the governor coming up. As that might be the only thing that could break this watershed in the House. So what I'm hearing you say is that while Speaker Ralston may be entirely sincere in, in his comments that he's not sure this bill is necessary, he also may be willing to use this to his political advantage as we get down to the end of the session, and he really wants to uh, bring the uh, the more conservative members of the Republican caucus uh, in line on some legislation. And everything's going to be in play these last few days. And, and some legislation that you might think is dead might get tacked onto other pieces of, of, of legislation, and it might suddenly be revived. So, so there's no counting this bill out yet. So. Um, the, the question becomes that you can, we continue to have this um, uh, interesting argument. Josh McCoon says that his bill does nothing more than the federal RIFRA law passed during the Clinton administration does, and he claims that he can, no one can cite any evidence that that uh, law has been used to discriminate against gays, lesbians, or anyone else. And then on the other side, George Equality, Jeff Graham, Elton John, and others saying this is absolutely uh, a license to discriminate. Yeah, they say it's an end run around the First Amendment. And, and you know, where, the, where that act, actual answer is might be up to the courts to decide if this actually, you know, ends up passing and becoming law. But there's a huge gray area. And as you mentioned, on Monday, for the first time, you had the opponents of this bill with a giant rally at the State House. You had religious leaders, you had business owners, you had a, you had a district attorney all say exactly that, that this is, this is bill, license to discriminate is what they called it. Um, in, in Arizona, when the legislature passed a similar bill, although some would argue a bill that wasn't even as, as strong it, it, as, as this uh, uh, McCoon bill is, um, the very conservative governor, Jan Brewer, uh, vetoed the bill because she was getting so much pressure from the business community. They were looking to court the Super Bowl at that point. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can't take this on. We can't alienate the business community. Here in Georgia, maybe it's being played out behind the scenes, but is the Metro Atlanta Chamber, is the Georgia Chamber really stepping up on this, or are they step, are they in the, in the background in some way? They're in the background. I mean, you're exactly right. They're not playing the vocal role that I think a lot of people thought they would on this bill. That might be because a lot of their, uh, their bandwidth is being taken up by the transportation bill. That's their number one push this session as well. There are forces, they, there are groups, you know, backed by businesses that are monitoring and setting up some of these opponents and, 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 and you know, watching watching this bill very carefully and opposing it, but the Georgia Chamber and the Metro Atlanta Chamber has not been a forceful, played a forceful role that we've seen publicly yet against these legislation. Okay, so if you're right that this piece of legislation is being held as a chit uh, in terms of what happens, the maneuvering uh, on other legislation as we get to close to the end, that suggests that we could be sitting at 11 o'clock on sine die, the 40th night of the session, watching to see whether this bill actually passes or not. Is that right? You got it. You can't rule anything out. You really can't, especially something that, it, that passed with overwhelming support in the Senate. All right. We'll watch it very interestingly. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be very big. You have 20 seconds to tell me what else is on your radar that you're really interested in following. We're watching Governor Deal's Opportunity School District. There's it will likely reach a full vote in the House next week. And there's a lot of Republicans, as we said earlier, who are voicing uh, some di dissension to it. For a long time, people have said the governor's going to need maybe Democrats to get this bill passed in the House. And it's beginning to look like that may be right. Yes. We'll see if House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams frees up her caucus to vote as they wish. All right, Greg Bluestein of the Atlanta Journal Constitution, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Thanks so much. So, day 32 of the 2015 legislative session is a wrap. We'll be back tomorrow with full coverage of day 33 and the countdown to Sine Die. Come on, Sine Die. In the meantime, stay in touch with us on social media or email us at lawmakers at gpb.org. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.
This is a GPB original production.